Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us tonight for the third installment of the 5G webinar series produced by the SIE Telecommunications section. Tonight, we'll be discussing 5G spectrum. Before we start, just a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of the presentation and this webinar will be made available on the SIE YouTube channel, SIE TV. The recording will also be made available on the SIE website under the events drop down menu in the section past events and webinars. This page is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads and subscribe to our YouTube channel. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar once we have received the CPD validation number from EXA. I'd like to now introduce you to our host tonight is uh, Dr. Albert Lisko, Professor Albert Lisko, my apologies. He's the chairman of the SIA telecommunications section. Professor Lisko is an award-winning engineer, researcher and innovator. He is a principal researcher with the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR, and adjunct professor at the University of Cape Town and an extraordinary researcher at the Northwest University, South Africa. Prof. Liska is a fellow of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers. As a volunteer for the Institution of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, Prof. Liska has organized over 100 events and three international conferences. Prof. Liska has numerous IEEE awards for volunteering. Under his leadership, IEEE South Africa received its first global IEEE MGA award. Prof. Liska. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to welcome everybody uh, to this uh, webinar and uh, thank you for uh, devoting your time to self-improvement. I think it's a very uh, good thing uh, happening uh, in South Africa and uh, other African countries uh, that we uh, drive uh, the innovation forward and uh, make sure that uh, um, we um, are competitive. Well, I would like to, for a second, put a mask on, just uh, as a reminder uh, that uh, we need to give respect to the fact that we have the third wave of COVID-19 rising up. And if you all respect the fact, then uh, it shall hopefully not be big. Well, having highlighted this uh, as I'm at home, I think <laughs> it's pretty safe uh, to take the mask off. All right. Uh, I would also like thank, uh, to say thank you very much uh, to uh, the main driver behind the event, uh, that is Pascal. Uh, Pascal uh, Mozzolese. Uh, he is a junior uh, vice president elect of uh, SAIE. And of course, uh, to Minx, uh, who is hosting uh, these uh, 5G events. Uh, uh, and making sure that everything is happening and running very smoothly. And uh, others uh, for their strong support uh, and uh, making this uh, a reality. Uh, I would like uh, to also appreciate that several parties support this event, uh, starting, of course, with South African Institute of Electrical Engineers and uh, African Utility Telecommunications, or nowadays Technologies Council as well as IEEE South Africa and IEEE Africa Council and SIGRE. Thank you for helping to promote the event. Um, I would like to highlight that South Africa is bringing forward many activities to support the efforts to introduce 5G. Um, and this also received strong support from government. Um, SAIE and IEEE uh, run conferences and events. Uh, IEEE published documents around health and safety uh, concerns uh, addressing them. Um, a 5G training program uh, was, uh, is being run right now by Youth ICT Council uh, in association with Huawei as a program for young entrepreneurs. It was launched just yesterday. 
and uh, other programs. Uh, and hopefully this uh, series uh, of uh, talks uh, helps to develop better understanding and take better advantage of uh, 5G and other cellular and wireless technologies in the country. Well, uh, so I would like to mention as the chairman of SAIE telecommunications section that uh, our telecom section is one of the supporters for this series of events. And um, the well, mission of the section is uh, to offer members interesting activities in relevant talks uh, in telecom. Uh, well, you have uh, probably already seen uh, announcements about 5G, a second petition for students. Um, well, we are having this 5G series of events and more activities are to come. Um, we had the, section, uh, the section's very first organizational meeting for 2021 on Monday uh, evening, and more will follow. Everyone is welcome to participate and contribute, uh, propose ideas, talks, uh, activities, and so on. Uh, just uh, drop me email. And um, well, to join the section, uh, uh, Please fill in an online form. I will post uh, the uh, form. We will post the form in the chat uh, for this event. And I think we will remind about the, uh, the form a little bit later. So today's speakers are Mr. Adrian uh, Grilly and Mr. William Stuckey. Well, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our uh, first speaker, uh, Adrian Grilly. Um, he has spent 30 years in the telecommunications sector. He is now a part-time fellow at the UK Radio Spectrum Management Organization and supports the European Utility Telecoms Councils Radio Spectrum Group. He was the principal author of the UTC White Cutting Through the Hype 5G and its potential impacts on electric utilities. White paper. Yes. Adrian has uh, always been active internationally, speaking at several Africa Utility Telecoms Council events and participating in European and international groups for standardization, telecommunications, and radio spectrum. He participates in these groups with the uh, ultimate aim of obtaining recognition of utility radio operations by the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, an activity currently being driven through ITU are study groups one and five with related activities in uh, Etsy and 3GPP. Uh, well, uh, let's uh, hope for more people will join uh, uh, doing such activities after this uh, uh, evening. Uh, I uh, pass over to you, Adrian. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Lisko. You should now be seeing my screen, which says Spectrum for 5G. Adrian, Adrian Grilly, is that correct? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, well, I'm most honoured to be invited to give this presentation. Thank you very much to um, the South African Institution of Electrical Engineers and also to um, uh, Africa UTC. Um, I'm greatly honoured. I've been to uh, South Africa a few times and seen some of the infrastructure and I've always greatly enjoyed my visits there. Um, just a comment following up on uh, Professor Listrow's comment about COVID and masks. I've had my two AstraZeneca um, in inoculations, so I am fully vaccinated um, with the AstraZeneca vaccination, and I was one of the fortunate people who had no side effects from those vaccinations. So I'm very pleased to be in that situation and encourage others, if you get the opportunity, to take up the vaccinations. Um, so I want to talk about Spectrum for 5G, but from a utility perspective rather than either a consumer or an operator perspective. Um, you may find this slightly different. Um, I may be a little cynical and sceptical of some of the, uh, the greater claims for 5G, but looking at it from an operational perspective as a utility. 
so what I'll do is I'll talk about EUTC because you may not uh, know about the European Utility Telecom Council. It's a bit like the African Utility Telecom Council, but obviously we work in Europe and we work closely together. Uh, relationships with other representative bodies because there are a lot of people active in the uh, 5G arena. Um, I'll mention some of the utility cases as we see it for 5G, the technology pillars of 5G, and then get on to the pioneer spectrum bands um, that affect us. I'll talk a little about channel bandwidths and then see how low you can go with your uh, your spectrum for 5G, whereas everybody else is looking at the top end. Um, I'll have some conclusions, um, uh, a couple of items for further reading, and then some recent developments over past days and weeks, and I suspect William Stuckey will, uh, will want to focus on some of those as well. So EUTC, the European Utility Telecoms Council, we represent the specific technical and regulatory interests of electric, gas and water utilities, um, all of which are considered to be critical national infrastructure. Um, EUTC is membership driven with major utility participation from large and small utility operators, including those in Spain, France, Holland, um, Germany, Portugal, Ireland, Italy and the UK. And you can see the logos of some of those companies um, around the screen. It's important, these are mainly the big generation companies. They are transmission, they are distribution, and some of them also are in the supply and retail element. But EUTC is more focused on the network and not focused on supply or, um, or the uh, consumer side of the energy market. Other there are plenty of other organizations there. And we engage globally with stakeholders, including the vendors, um, operators, um, to assure that ensure alignment of new products, standards, and spectrum allocations with utility requirements. Um, and Julian Stafford will join us on the uh, discussion panel. He's EUTC's Secretary General and is doing a lot of work in 3GPP. Now, I put that last point there, proactively responding to consultations from the European Commission and European energy and telecoms regulators and governments regarding the digitalization of the energy sector. And I know the African UTC is engaged there. Um, in Europe, within CPT, our regional organization, we have 48 administrations. Each of those administrations will have an energy regulator, a telecoms regulator, and possibly a water regulator. So when we're particularly when we're talking to people in the US, we have to stress that we've got over a hundred government departments, over a hundred regulators to try and deal with. And I haven't counted how many European languages we've got, but obviously multiple languages for those consultations. So it's a major exercise to try and present a coherent utility view. Um, but we do this with other bodies like the Utility Telecom Council in the US and Canada, um, Utility Telecom Council in Latin America, that's South America and Central America, and of course, African UTC. We also work with the Critical Communications Association, TCCA, which used to be the Tetra and Critical Communications Association. They have a Critical Communications Broadband Group and a SCADA group, so we work with them. There's the 450 Alliance, and again, Julian Stafford is our key link there, and with the third generation public-private par partnership group, which develops the 5G standards and 3GPP. So, this is most probably a triangle that you've seen before about 5G usage. And at the top here, we have enhanced mobile broadband. And what I've said is that's where all the media hype and excitement tend to be focused. Everyone talking about how much data you can get down a 5G connection. Um, but our utility interests really are down here at the bottom, machine to machine type communications, ultra reliable, low latency communications. We're down here at the bottom of the, the pyramid. Um, and it perhaps highlights that up at this end, the top end in, in Europe, most people already have one uh, mobile connection. We used to have multiple mobile connections for our laptops and our tablets and phones. But in general now, we use Wi-Fi wherever we can. And if we can't, we stream onto our mobile phone. So the, the capacity to expand this market is limited up here where you've got people involved. Where the real growth comes is where you've got all these machines and machine communication, and that's where the growth will come in the future. For utility applications, 
trying to think about the ones at the top end, fixed wireless access might be useful. And particularly if you think about a substation where you're trying to, we've got lots of wire to connect pieces of equipment, it's possible in, this, in the future we'll use a 5G connection around substations. Um, there are exciting applications that we might um, want to talk about in the, uh, in the panel, um, looking at drones, particularly where you can replace helicopters. We overfly our networks in the, in the UK, um, transmission networks fairly regularly. Helicopters are expensive. You could do that with a drone because it flies exactly the same path week in, week out. Augmented reality, helping people in remote locations to work on perhaps switch gear that they're not familiar with. Um, and CCTV for security. Um, but the real application space is SCADA, um, the monitoring and control of networks, <clears throat> automation, um, teleprotection, which is the very low latency requirements to disconnect equipment if you get faults on it, and of course metering. And I'll come back at the end because everybody will talk very excitedly about you know, 5G and what it could do for metering. But if you think about electricity, gas or water meter, they are very low cost products. GPRS, the existing 2G technology, is very good at doing that, very low data rates and very low cost. And if we talk about you know, a 5G modem on an electricity meter, and you're only going to want to pay um, a few euros, a few dollars for that um, communications device, it may be a long time before 5G gets to that sort of price point. So the technology pillars for 5G, um, there's the spectrum one we're going to think about. And uh, I've taken quite a bit of material from Roden Schwartz, the equipment manufacturer, and I've put a link on the last slide, which will also be in the chat, to some of their free material. It's very good on 5G and very helpful. Um, and you can see the bands here, the, the great 60, 70 gigahertz bands down to 30, 40 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz, three and a half gigahertz and the 700, 800, 900 bands. Um, the line they put on here is actually the absorption line where you can see the 60 gigahertz oxygen absorption band and the rain absorption band. I'll come back to those later. I suspect William Stuckey will as well. Um, the idea of 5G that you can be connected to multiple base stations to really get your data rate um, higher, which again is not a great deal of interest to us for high data rates. This idea of network slicing that you can have a virtual um, network on a 5G system. Um, and then the idea of how you can get better spectrum efficiency through um, beam forming. So your base station can have multiple beams to multiple devices all around it. Um, Hopefully most of our utility applications are fixed. We hope they're not moving. If they are moving, then we want an alarm to be raised. Um, but all this, all this fancy technology is really great at the higher frequency bands, above six gigahertz, you know, 30, 40, 50 gigahertz. If you want to try and do beam steering, you can do it at about 400 megahertz. And I've got an example here of a very sophisticated 400 megahertz um, steerable beam antenna. Um, you'll notice you can't actually see me in that picture, but that gives you the scale of the sort of equipment you need to do beam steering at 400 megahertz. So it's possible, but perhaps we won't see it um, for um, 5G and utilities. So getting on to the spectrum area, um, what I've put here is um, an example of um, the spectrum which people are looking at for various 5G applications in various countries. And you can see it's disparate. There are lots of different bands being look, looked at in a lot of countries around the world. And we won't get the standardization until we can start to focus down on a few bands. So later on, I'll come to the key bands. But I've taken a, a spectrum diagram here from, um, it's actually, I think, the New York Times. Um, and it's very general. And it talks about broad broadcast TV, existing cell phones, 5G, airport scanners, and new um, radio therapies in the medical area. And from an electromagnetic spectrum point of view, um, I hope I'm not going too basic here, but you've got visible light, and then you've got your ultraviolet light, you've got your infrared heaters here. We've then got the radio spectrum here, going down to ultra low frequency. And we know that these higher frequencies, X-rays and gamma rays, these are damaging to health. And we've seen quite a lot of issues 
in Europe, and I, I don't know if you've got the same thing in South Africa, of people claiming that um, 5G is damaging health, it's caused COVID, it's caused every sort of um, malignant problem. And so the reason I put this in here is just to illustrate that 5G is really just a continuation and an overlap with some of our existing radio systems that we see around the place. Now, if you're worried about safety, as, as I always say, electromagnetic radiation does have an impact on our bodies. Visible light means we can see. Um, and if I come to South Africa, because I need to come to South Africa for some infrared radiation from the sun, it's very warming and we don't see much of it up here in, uh, in Europe or certainly in England. Um, but we know that ultraviolet radiation from the sun is damaging. So you, know, you, you keep out of the sun. We also know that intensity is important because if we look down here, there's the three gigahertz line. We know that microwave ovens operate here at 2.4 gigahertz. So if I want a cup of coffee after this meeting, I will go and stick it in the microwave oven for a couple of minutes and it will heat up that, um, that coffee. But we also know that's in the ISM, the Industrial Scientific and Medical Band at 2.4 gigahertz. Um, and that's the same frequency as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Now, I could most probably put my cup of coffee in front of my Bluetooth transmitter and I could do it for 100 years and the cup of coffee still wouldn't get hot. So you can see the intensity of the energy is important, it's not just the frequency. And 5G systems will not cause um, problems from their, um, from their electromagnetic radiation because the energy density is too low, um, which is why as I always say, you need to cover a country with base stations for cell phones because the energy levels are relatively low. So the health problems of 5G will be no different to existing radio systems. Um, and I think you know, as long as one is careful about the energy density levels, they'll be as harmless as Bluetooth rather than the same effect that you get from a, a microwave oven. So I just wanted to mention the, um, the safety angle of the spectrum. So coming to the, the key bands which are being focused on, which is the 700 megahertz band, the sort of three and a half gigahertz band, and then the, the 24, 25, 26, 28 gigahertz band. And what we see is of course that 700 megahertz, 700 megahertz, 800, 900 megahertz, they are great for coverage, but the capacity is limited. At the 24 to 28 gigahertz, enormous capacity but very limited coverage and that's why a lot of the attention has been focused on the three and a half gigahertz band which can combine reasonable coverage with a good payload um, and that's where the main um, spectrum auctions are focused at the moment um, and like any good auction they throw in a bit of 700 to make sure that the operators will cover the areas that they're not desperately interested in because basically they're trying to sell products, sell business, and they're trying to get as much business as possible. And that's in three and a half gigs band at the moment. So 5G generally splits into two bands, the frequency range one, FR1, um, from around about 400 megahertz to six gigahertz. I'll come into more detail on that later. And then frequency range two, 24 gigahertz up to 86 gigahertz or wherever. Um, and traditionally there's been this gap in the middle <clears throat> between the two, two bands, though that will close a little. And we can see that um, we've got this thing, 5G new radio. 5G will use LTE quite extensively. And we say 5G is an evolution rather than a revolution. It's a migration from 4G LTE up to <clears throat> a new technology which particularly gets its capacity from the higher frequencies that it accesses. It doesn't get a lot of extra capacity from modulation. 4G LTE can deliver very similar data rates in the same bands, um, but 5G is designed to go to these higher frequencies. So <clears throat> starting whilst the, they talk about very high frequency bands in the 80 gigahertz region, but in reality, the highest bands that people are looking at at the moment is the 26 to 28 gigahertz bands. And even those are 
really useful if you've got a stadium um, I know Wembley Stadium holds about 85,000 people. I'm not sure what your biggest stadium is in um, in South Africa. But if you're trying to deliver 5G communications to them, you can have very tight beams, very high capacity in very small areas. And that's where these um, higher, the 20 gigahertz bands come in. Um, but they won't go very far. As, as I'm, I'm sure you know from even your Wi-Fi, your Wi-Fi doesn't go very far. Um, and, and when you get up to these bands, any obstruction in their way, trees, foliage, um, buildings will obstruct 26 gigahertz. So it's really line of sight communications. Um, so if you're pointing up at a satellite, you can go 35,000 kilometers and back again. But if you've got a wall in the way, it will stop it. Now, if we look at the 26 gigahertz band here, which is, you'll see that Europe supports this, 24.25 to 27.25, that's the European Pioneer Band. And as in all things, the US is different. The US is keen on the 28 gigahertz band. The reason Europe isn't keen on the 28 gigahertz band is because of this satellite band, and we don't want to cause problems to satellites there. We do have to watch um, this um, satellite band here, which is Earth observation satellites, which are very important for um, climate considerations. So the 26 gig band here is being very cautious to try and avoid um, uh, interference there. But the main dispute is between Europe, which wants the 26 gig band, and America that wants the 28 gigs band here. Um, where the harmonization will end up, who knows? And in terms of what you will do in South Africa, it depends on how you want to protect existing services. Um, you can see that they're identifying the 23 gigahertz band here for backhaul. 23 gigahertz does have some rain problems because it's a, um, a fairly affected by rain, but the operators recognize that they will need backhaul, and so that's what they're looking at 23 gigahertz for. If we now come down to the three and a half gigahertz bands where all the money is being generated in the auctions at the moment around the world. And the sort of bands that we're looking at are from 3.3 gigahertz right up to 4.2 gigahertz. But there's only globally harmonized 200 kilohertz here in the middle. Um, and you can see the 3GPP standardization has got a number of bands here. And the operators are desperate to get access to this spectrum in most countries. Um, because it combines reasonable penetration and coverage with good capacity. Um, so if we look at the, um, as I say, the radio regulations have got 200 megahertz of harmonized spectrum, but this is from the uh, GSMA, the operator's um, uh, organization, and it shows that in many countries they have extended the uh, three and a half gigahertz band to include some spectrum below and some above to try and get up to a large amount of spectrum in the three and a half gigahertz band. So that's the main focus at the moment. Um, from a utility perspective, it's, it's interesting. Um, if you can have high towers and you've got flat terrain, it covers really well. So Centerpoint Energy in Houston have got a really good um, network is actually um, WiMAX. But in the US, because of their planning arrangements, they can just drop a 150 foot pole, a 50 meter pole into the ground, stick an antenna on it. And that part of Texas is very flat. You get very good coverage. Um, in Europe, we have a lot more restrictions on what you can do in terms of the heights of your antenna. We have perhaps a much more hilly terrain in some countries like the UK. So three and a half gigahertz doesn't cover very well if you're a utility. It just does not get to um, the bits of your network that you want. And the other thing, if you've been to the US um, compared to Europe, everything is mounted on poles above ground, it seems, over there. You know, all the wires are above ground, the, the, um, the traffic lights are above ground, the telecoms wires are all above ground. In Europe, a lot of our infrastructure is buried, we don't, um, which aesthetically looks a lot more pleasing, 
but it does make it very difficult to reach and that's why we like the uh, the lower frequency bands because our utility infrastructure is a lot lower we've got i think perhaps different geography and three and a half gigahertz isn't really going to be of that much use to a utility over a wide area in europe so looking at where we are um, and the world radio conference 2019 looked studied all these various gigahertz bands for um, <clears throat> 5g um, but you can see that the focus here was on the higher frequencies um, which um, without being degrading to regulators is very exciting but utilities cannot make money in these bands at the moment so we're not utilities the operators can't make money in these bands so when we look at world radio conference 23 suddenly we find that they're looking at much lower frequency bands <clears throat> and region one here within which africa is obviously europe and africa are region one the americas are region two asia pacific is region three and you can see that some of these bands are being um, region one is looking at 470 to 960 the three and a half gigahertz bands there's a 4.8 band there um, six gigahertz which we'll come on to later um, but the main focus down here in the lower frequencies region two the americas up here region three asia pacific um, the the relationship i was saying here is that suddenly region two the americas is looking at something at 10 gigahertz right in the middle between frequency band one which goes from 7.125 down and the 25 26 gigahertz bands up here whether this will become <coughs> globally attractive i don't know um, but you can see that people are looking at lots of different frequency bands but the the vendors the manufacturers obviously want to concentrate on as fewer bands as possible to keep costs down um, so <clears throat> i put this band this diagram on um, don't look at it in too much detail but the the 5g new radio data rates um, you can see that they get their spectrum efficiency by going to these very large bandwidths and you can only get these very large bandwidths at the higher frequencies obviously and within a bandwidth you have these um these individual carriers and and you can see that again when you get up to the higher frequencies you've got very big individual carriers as utilities this is where we like to focus narrow bandwidth even 50 megahertz is too too large a bandwidth but 15 kilohertz carriers within that bandwidth is um is very useful to us as i'll come on to later um, but what the other point i wanted to bring out in this slide is if you look at lte lte has much lower uh, smaller bandwidths it's got the 15 kilohertz carriers um, downlink 100 mega uh, megabits per second uplink 100 megabits per second Th these are fine for utilities these are more attractive bandwidths but the spectral efficiency of lte is pretty close to 5g new radio and you wouldn't as certainly as a utility want to put a lot of investment in to get those sort of efficiency gains they're just not worth having so you can see that lte is still a very good technology and one of the issues for the whole 5G community as a sort of a 5G skeptic is them trying to persuade people to migrate from LTE. Because when you're down here with LTE, as a user, there is not a lot of benefit in moving up the scale unless you want these massive data rates. Um, and certainly in a utility, you don't need those massive data rates. Um, <clears throat> so you can see my 5G skepticism starting to creep in there. So how low can you go here we are and this is this is the bit i wanted to um, focus on because frequency band one used to be 450 megahertz to six gigahertz and they're all excited about frequency range two up here the first thing they did was change the six gigahertz up to 7.125 and I'll, I'll come back to that at the end why that's gone up to uh, seven gigahertz but you know, my cynicism and scepticism perhaps is well-founded because 
you can see that they are trying to push the boundaries of the lower frequency range, frequency range one. The 450 is the interesting one <coughs> because I think that has now gone down to 410 megahertz um, and there's a possibility of it going down to 380 megahertz. These are the areas that we need it to go down to as utilities to get the coverage, both in terms of range, distance covered, and penetration down into the, um, particularly water systems, which may be below ground. Um, and 400 megahertz is really good for getting down in those ranges um, where frequency range two will never reach. If you look at the sort of the bandwidths, you can see also by the way that the, the higher frequencies are time division duplex single frequency systems. At the bottom end, there's some time division duplex, but mainly we like frequency division duplex FDD because it, um, it gives you better, a better planned system. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that the carrier subspacing here, again, is much more amenable to the lower, um, the smaller frequency blocks that we need. Um, we don't, you can see again, the, the bandwidths being required here are 50, 100, 400 megahertz. Down here, you can get down to five megahertz bandwidths. And in these bands, the 380, 400 band, 410, 430, 450, 470, <clears throat> you've only got five megahertz of spectrum. So these sort of bandwidths are of no interest to us. We want to, as utilities, with range and low latency, we want to be down in this part of the, um, uh, the scheme, which is really the old um, 4G LTE part of the system. So in terms of the spectrum that we need, um, the first thing I'd say to you as users is you, that you need to ensure that your, spec, your voice is heard by policymakers and regulators in South Africa, by CASA is the people that you need to be speaking to, to make sure that they hear your voice and speaking as a utility or a vertical sector, um, that's quite important to us. Um, now, the reason I'm pleased we've got to Julian Stafford on the uh, panel is the need to engage with standards bodies, especially 3GPP, to ensure that utility requirements are incorporated into 5G standards. Otherwise, the standards are written from an operator's perspective. Um, and just for an example there, one of the ones which um, is of concern to us is that if you take a SCADA standard, the SCADA system will be passing messages backwards and forwards, but you will have alarms in there. If you lose power to a system, that comes through as an alarm. If you get a temperature excursion, you want to come through as an alarm. Now, within five, within certainly LTE at the moment, um, GPRS or whatever, they will give you a priority for your SCADA service. Um, and that SCADA service may have a lower priority than some other things, but there's no ability to hand that alarm requirement through from the SCADA protocol into the 5G protocol to get it sent across the 5G network as a high priority message because you've lost power. And that's quite important because the power is most probably supporting the 5G network and the 5G network will go down very quickly after it loses power, if not instantly. So the ability to pass alarms through from our utility protocols into the 5G standards to get priority treatment is very important to us. Um, we'd, also, we'd also like to get some information on the network um, because as I say, networks generally depend on us for their electricity. Without our electricity, they go, they fall over. Sometimes they have battery support for those um, networks, but that battery support is usually for a very short period of time, perhaps an hour or two. <clears throat> now, what we'd like to be able to do from a utility perspective is if the network goes into fallback mode on battery to see how long that battery will last so that we know for how long we will continue to get communications to that site. Um, we then know whether we can restore power before the, the mobile network, the 5G network goes down or whether the 5G network is gonna run out of battery before we can repair the system and therefore we need to send out a crew that there to that site. So we'd, need to, we'd like to get some information on the network handed through the 5G standard. Um, and then perhaps the most important thing, 
we want private systems. We'd like to run our own systems in our substations, in our um, power stations, and also wide area systems. And for that, we need access to spectrum. And that's where our CASA comes in. The operators clearly do not want us to have access to spectrum, um, but we think we need that to run our own systems. We would also like to be able to interwork with the public networks. We don't necessarily want to put everything on private networks, but we want the rights to be able to interconnect and run our, run our um, data over their networks. And again, that's a regulatory issue. So that's where regulation becomes um, quite important. I mentioned previously, you know, what are the costs of these 5G devices? If you're buying a mobile phone, you might be able to afford to spend a few hundred dollars or um, euros on a mobile phone. If we're rolling out 10, 30, 40, 50 million meters, it's got to be cheap. If we're putting this into 10,000 or 100,000 pole tops, what's the cost of an embedded modem in our switch gear? So um, the costs are important to us. Um, we want to keep an eye, an eye on spectrum bands, which may be of interest. As we say, at the lower end, if 5G goes down to the lower end, it will be of much greater interest to us than if they just concentrate on the, uh, the 24, 25, 26 gigahertz regions. Um, but I'll show in a slide in a minute. Um, the other thing you have to be careful of is that 5G is looking for spectrum everywhere. And look at what spectrum you currently use and see whether the 5G community are trying to either interfere with it or steal it from you. Um, and that's, that's important. The, the other aspect is that all of this is focused on terrestrial type services and the satellite community haven't had a lot to do with 5G. But I mean, particularly for, for continents like Africa, where does satellite fit into this? You're never gonna get terrestrial networks for the whole of your, um, uh, your network. So somehow satellite has got to be integrated into the 5G world. Um, and then there's license exempt spectrum, unlicensed spectrum. Um, clearly the operators would like you to use their systems or they'll use the unlicensed and charge you to use it as well. But will we be able to have license exempt spectrum for 5G? Will you be able to build 5G around your home, your factories, your power stations using license exempt spectrum? So you don't have to pay high fees to either the operator for their service or the regulator for license spectrum. So there's that aspect. Now, <clears throat> I've got another couple of slides I'll just focus on, and these links will appear in the chat. Uh, Minx is going to very helpfully put them in there. Um, now, the a paper which actually I was the main author from is on the um, EUTC website, cutting through the hype, 5G and its potential impact on electric utilities, looking at where it will play in us as a vertical sector. I've taken quite a few pictures from the Roden Schwartz and white papers on their website. They're free, so I would encourage you, if you want to know more, to go and look at Roden Schwartz. They are really very helpful and their webinars are very informative. Um, I've then also put a link to um, a book. The book is quite expensive. It's Telecommunications Networks for Smart for the Smart Grid. It's the most comprehensive analysis I'm aware of um, into telecommunications for smart grids. It was written by Professor Alberto Sendin, who's very active in the UTC, um, a very good speaker and very knowledgeable on the subject. So I've just got two bits of extra material which I added um, in the last few days. The first one, now I know that William um, uh, Stokey is on the call, um, is about the ICASA announcement of spectrum in the 700, 800, 2.6 gigahertz and 3.5 gigahertz bands um, for IMT2000. Um, those are the six winners of the uh, competition. So I just put that up because I suspect we might focus on that in the, um, in the panel. And the issue about your spectrum, um, because even this week the GSMA have started to publish their case for why the um, uh, six gigahertz band need to be allocated to 5G. In the US, there are battles in the courts there, because if we look at the current ITU plan, and in most countries, the six gigahertz band from 5925 up to 7125 is used by 
mixed, fixed microwave links. Utilities are also major users of this band. We use it for backhaul. It is very important to us. There's also a satellite band there that we have to um, coordinate with. Now, the reason six gigahertz is important to us as utilities is that we have lost the 1.4 gigahertz band to mobile operation. We have lost the three and a half gigahertz band to mobile operators. And we were starting to put our fixed links into the six gigahertz band because we need lower frequencies, particularly where you want to be resilient to weather. And in places like South Africa, um, in general in Africa, the rain that you get on your links is much greater than we get in Europe. The effect on those links is severe. You need to be down in the lower regions, not up in 23 gigahertz, where they're very badly affected by rain. So we've been moving fixed links into these bands. We've been talking to the regulators <clears throat> about narrower channels. There are at the moment 30 megahertz channels, bringing them down to 14 or even seven megahertz so we can get our long range, low data rate links into these bands. And what we find is that um, <clears throat> the 5G community are going to, are trying to take over the six gigahertz band. So frequency range one has now been extended from six gigahertz up to seven one two five megahertz. And the proposals by China are the whole band should be licensed. The proposal in the US is that it should all be 5G unlicensed radio. In Europe, we're looking at um, 5G in the lower six gigahertz band from 5925 to 6425. But on top of the 5G community wanting to um, uh, sit in our fixed links band, we now have the new Wi Fi 6. Um, confusingly, Wi Fi 6 itself is the 5 gigahertz band from 5925 down to 5030, different in lots of different company, countries. But there's now this Wi-Fi 6E band, which for which they would like access for the whole of 5925 to 7125. And I've put up here something which I hope is helpful because Wi-Fi, the old 802.11b worked in 2.4 gigahertz, 802.11a was 5 gigahertz. Then we had other versions of 802.11, which were higher speed in um, 2.4, um, MIMO in 2.4 and 5G bands. And then this 802.11ac, which is the 5 gig band down here, um, which is very high capacity. And the new um, Wi-Fi 6E, which is 802.11x, which does 2.4, 5 gigs and 6 gigs. So as microwave users, we're now seeing competition from Wi-Fi and 5G for these um, six gigahertz bands, which are very crucial to our operations. So <clears throat> that's you know, what's happening as it were at the moment. So you can see the battle for 5G spectrum is between existing users and the new users. And we want the features of 5G, but we don't want to lose our old spectrum. So I think that most probably um, draws me to a close and I'll hand back to Minx for, the, um, for an introduction to uh, William. Thank you very much, uh, Adrian. It was a very interesting uh, discussion. I appreciate that. Uh, I learned a number of new things, even though I've been <laughs> reading around 5G for a while now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I got a number of questions uh, which I intend to ask. Uh, and um, I encourage all attendees uh, to start posting questions in the uh, question section of the tool which we are all, all using. Uh, I would also like to highlight that I'm happy to mention that we have a number of international attendees from uh, over uh, across Africa in uh, uh, the at, uh, well, list of attendees. So then without further ado, I would like to um, present our second uh, speaker, uh, William Stake. Um, he has a long history as a pioneer in the South African internet and advocates uh, for telecommunications liberalization in Africa. He programmed his first computer in 1972, 
built his first underground fiber optic and leaky feeder radio networks in 1987. William automated a couple of underground diamond mines and played a significant role in research and development for a fully automated sort house. He started uh, an internet service provider, ZANET, in 1996 and gained a round dozen industry firsts and consulted on many subjects in the information and communication technology fields, including Y2K, that is uh, year 2000 challenge. Um, it's also noteworthy to uh, mention he was an ICASA counselor. ICASA is a South African uh, uh, regulator, independent communications of Earth to South Africa. So he was a counselor there from 9, 2009 to 2014, where he most recently focused on television white spaces and dynamic spectrum assignment. Um, and uh, I think contributed significantly to TV white space becoming a reality. Now it's been launched commercially in South Africa. Thank you, William. Um, as always, uh, what a pleasure uh, to listen to you. Uh, so I'll hand over to you. Thank, Thank you. you sir. Uh, let me just get this started up and swap these around. Okay, you should be seeing my starting screen. Um, I'm going to tell you about Spectrum and a little bit about 5G. And Adrian has done an excellent job of talking about the different Spectrum bands um, that 5G uses. So I'm not going to pay a lot of attention to that. But I'm going to start at the very beginning for those of you who don't know what Spectrum is to make it easier for you to all understand this. And so let's talk about what is spectrum, what's the characteristics of spectrum are, spectrum fees, telecommunication uses a spectrum, point-to-point -point links, point-to-area links, broadcasting uses a spectrum, like traditional broadcasting and digital broadcasting, the situation in South Africa, and which bands does 5G use. So what is spectrum? So what we see here is the spectrum of visible light in a rainbow. And as you can see on the left, it shows you the colors. So red is from 400 to 484 terahertz. And what that means is it's a range of colors. And there are obviously many, many shades of, 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 of red, many shades of orange. And the shades are indicated by those different frequencies. Um, and the term spectrum refers to any of those ranges. And it can be applied to frequency or bandwidth, space, time, or even number. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, we will be mostly using the frequency sense of the term. And the plural of spectrum is spectra. So spectrum is the range of electromagnetic frequencies of interest uh, for this presentation. And ICASA, and uh, Adrian, we not quite as English as you are, we pronounce it as ICASA rather than ICASA, uh, regulates from nine kilohertz to one terahertz. Um, FM radio uses, uh, uses from 87 and a half megahertz to 108. Uh, UHF uh, TV broadcasting uses from 470 megahertz to 860 megahertz. And that's the significance of the 450 megahertz that Adrian was talking about just now. Cell phones use a number of bands, including 400, uh, 900, 1800, 2100, and so on. And 5G uses two bands, the or two broad bands, if you like. The frequency band range one is from 450 megahertz, or as Adrian says, is now being expanded to six gigahertz. And that includes the LTE frequency range that we're currently using for, for our cell phones and various other things. And the frequency range two is from 24, point, uh, and 24 and a quarter gigahertz to 52 gigahertz. And visible light is 400 to 787 terahertz. And one terahertz is 1,000 gigahertz. And 1,000 gig, uh, megahertz is one gigahertz. And 1,000 kilohertz is one megahertz. 1,000 hertz is one kilohertz, as I'm sure you all know. So the ITU's frequency uh, specifies these frequency bands as follows. from e extremely low frequency, which is down from three hertz to 30 hertz, all the way up to extremely high frequency, which is 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz, or one centimeter to one millimeter. So the very high frequencies that we're talking about using for frequency range two are commonly known as the millimeter band, band range because they're part of this. And these first four frequencies are commonly called the audio range because they're more or less what we can hear. So, ICASA, as a regulator, um, allocates 
spectrum for a particular service or purpose. And this is in line with the ITU agreements. The ITU is International Telecommunications Union, which I think is probably the oldest international organization um, that we have of the sort. The minister determines policy and approves the South African <coughs> uh, uh, table of frequency allocations, which the class of drafts. Uh, once these once that has been done, Spectrum is assigned to a specific user at a specific frequency and a specific location within the relevant, alloc within the relevant allocation. Um, I see we have a problem with internet access here. Um, it costs a, it assigns Spectrum and issues licenses for use, and it costs collects uh, Spectrum fees. And here is the table of South African uh, uh, um, frequency allocations. This is the 2004 table. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because no one has <laughs> made a pretty picture since then. It's often called a band plan. Um, and it's a framework or allocation plan. And you can see the legend at the bottom down here, if you can see my mouse, um, that tells you what each color is for. Uh, let's talk about the spect characteristics, characteristics of spectrum. The frequency of a electromagnetic radiation, and as Adrian explained to you, he showed you the whole range from the very bottom end all the way up to X-rays um, and beyond. Um, this is measured in hertz, or kilohertz, or megahertz, or gigahertz, or terahertz, um, and there are those numbers. And the period of a of a, 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 a signal is the time from the peak, one peak to the next peak. The peak amplitude is from the middle to the top. And the RMS amplitude, or voltage RMS, or uh, um, is is the root mean square. In other words, if you were to draw a line there, it has the same area as you have. Whoops, my apologies. Underneath, uh, under the red curves. I've noticed a tendency recently when people buying speakers and amplifiers, um, they quoting peak power, peak watts which is quite silly, really, um, because uh, the peak power out of an amplifier could be a kilowatt for a millisecond but the actual it can't produce a kilowatt all the time it might only produce in 10 watts or a miss so uh, i think it's just a marketing gimmick so be aware that peak power and rms power are vastly different bandwidth is when a signal is transmitting using radio waves generally the information is modulated onto a carrier wave and the carrier wave has a single frequency and modulating the carrier widens the signal. Sorry, that's not quite true. If we're talking about things like LTE, we use a multiple, many signal, single frequencies, plural. Um, and that's called OFDM, orthogonal divisional frequency multiplexing. Modulating the carrier widens the signal in terms of frequency. And this widening is, widening is called bandwidth. So let's talk about modulation. Let's start with a carrier wave at some frequency. And there's our carrier wave, as you can see. And then we add a modulating signal like that. And what do we get? Well, if we're doing amplitude modulation, we get a carrier wave. Yeah. I'm on camera. Go away. Thank you. <clears throat> um, if, we, if we're doing amplitude modulation, we start with a carrier wave with a single high frequency and then a modulating wave, which is one or more low frequency signals. And the modulated result, as you can see at the bottom here, is a complex wave consisting of more than one frequency. Therefore, it has bandwidth. And frequency modulation does the same thing, except instead of modulating the amplitude, it modulates the frequency of the result, as you can see at the bottom here. So when the signal is low, the frequency is low. When the signal is high, the bandwidth is high. Uh, when, the, when the signal is high, the amplitude is high when the signal is low, the amplitude is low with AM and FM. So when we're talking about AM or FM modulation, here we have something different. This is a an envelope of varying amplitude and a carrier wave of constant frequency. Um, and here we have, uh, and with AM in the top, and the bottom we've got FM with a constant amplitude and varying frequency. So constant frequency, varying frequency, varying amplitude, constant amplitude. So bandwidth can be measured like this, where we say zero dB is the is 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 the initial sig is one value, and then the minus three is the peak value, and the minus three dB is this point here at root three of of, of the thing, and the bandwidth is measured between the low and the high frequencies. 
And notice that the axis on this graph is frequency, it's not time. Often allocated spectrum is divided up into channels to make assignment and coordination easier. For example, in South Africa, FM radio was allocated the VHF, which means very high frequency range of 87.5 megahertz to 108 megahertz. This gives 204 FM radio channels if all channels are used. Can all these channels be used at once? Well, that's a good question. Some countries use odd channels and some countries use even channels. South Africa does use both, but uh, not often adjacent to each other. And the reason is because if you have an old TIPO um, FM radio, it may not have sufficient uh, uh, selectivity to be able to separate those 100 uh, kilohertz signals apart from each other. And this is the very complex um, modulation for an FM, FM radio. And as you can see, it's about 100, just under 100 kilohertz wide. It's got the mono audio, and it's got the stereo audio, and it's got the radio data system, um, and uh, the pilot signal, and all sorts of things. Interference. A radio signal can suffer from interference from many causes. Electrical machinery, motors, hair dryers, electric fences, tick, 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 switch gear, fluorescent lights, their favorite one, microwave ovens, as Adrian explained, uh, the 2.4 gigahertz band was deemed to be junk because it is the band that excites the OH bond in water um, and is therefore absorbed um, by anything that's wet. Um, and so it was deemed to be junk and it was used for, uh, assigned for uh, allocators, should I say, for microwave ovens. And then the US um, FCC decided, well, it's junk frequency anyway, spectrum anyway, so let's use people, let people use it on an unlicensed basis. Um, we, uh, we call that in South Africa license exempt, but it has the same general meaning, more or less. And of course, out of that, we have Wi-Fi, which has been the single most successful use of spectrum in the history of humanity. Uh, lightning is uh, another cause of interference, the sun, thermal floor, and the residual background microwave radiation of the universe, and of course, other radio signals. So a radio receiver has a certain minimal signal level that it needs to receive to be able to detect a signal at all. You can think of it as like, like getting over a step or a low wall. And interference increases the height of the wall. And let's look at that graphically. So the noise, so here's your ear, that's your receiver, and here's the noise floor. So you have to get a signal that goes over that. And this signal it is too weak, it doesn't manage that. This signal just makes it over the wall, and it's only just strong enough. And this signal here is plenty strong enough and it's comfortably powerful enough and there's no problem. But what happens if there's some, if there's some interference? Um, what happens to that signal? What happens is that that noise floor is raised by the interference. And so the signal that was only just strong enough doesn't get through anymore. So this is why you have to have a sufficient the strong signal to ensure that you have a good chance of, of, of getting through, and typically this figures about 6 dB, um, but not so strong that you are overpowering uh, uh, that signal or you're bleeding into other channels. So there are basically two kinds of radio interference. The co-channel interference which means that on the same it's on the same frequency, and that's caused by frequency reuse, especially in cellular networks, or poor frequency planning, or adverse weather conditions, or overcrowding, or time of day effects, because sometimes you find things will come from over the horizon, um, and from somewhere far away, but only at certain times of day. And then there's also adjacent channel uh, interference. So you heard Adrian talking about high frequencies and low frequencies. Um, and Everyone seems to know that high frequencies carry more data, um, but low frequencies go further, but nobody seems to know quite why. Um, signals in free space are attenuated by the square of the distance, so near is good. The amount of data that can be carried by signals is proportional to its frequency, so high frequency is good. But the path loss in free space also depends on the square of the frequency. Um, most people forget that. And attenuation by walls, trees, etc., also increases with frequency. So low frequency is good. So here we have here we have a, a conflict. We want both high frequency and low frequency, and we get around this by using low frequencies in some circumstances, for example, in rural areas um, for long range, or in urban areas where we want to have uh, wall penetration, um, but at low, low low bandwidth. And we use high frequencies primarily in urban areas where we want to carry a lot of data. 
So look, let's think about attenuation by distance. Imagine a signal transmitted this sphere from a point source. This is called isotropic radiation, and it means radiating equally in all directions, in three dimensions. And it will have a, a practical antenna, usually a dipole or upright stick, one quarter of a wavelength long, also called an omnidirectional antenna, because it radiates in all horizontal directions, not vertical directions, or a dish which focuses the radiation in a particular direction. Um, because the radio beam is focused, it's more concentrated in some directions than others, and this means that the signal strength in the desired direction uh, is stronger than it would be if radiated in all directions. This, it is effectively amplified, and we call this the gain of the antenna measured in dB. Equally, it's weaker in the undesired directions. So a negative value for dB means a ratio of less than one. And these calculations apply to free space are not inside a conductor like a wire or a waveguide. So, get, so our signal is transmitted from a sphere, from, in a sphere from a point source. And to have a certain strict signal strength, at, which we call zero dB, at a distance of one meter from the antenna. Uh, dB is short for decibels, and it's a logarithmic measure of ratios. At twice the distance, two meters, the same amount of power or energy is spread over a sphere with twice the radius. So it has four times the surface because the area of a sphere is a function of the square of its radius. So the signal strength will be one quarter as strong, or minus six dB. And at a distance of three meters, the signal strength will be one ninth as strong, or minus nine and a half dB. And here's a picture of that to make it clearer. So consider a sphere, and there we have an antenna radiating uh, at a, a, a radiating a signal. And the antenna is subtending a the amount of power per unit area. So that's that that's antenna is picking up a certain amount of power because of the angle it's sub subtending. So it's getting the that proportion of the total of the energy radiated by by the antenna. But if the antenna is further away, it subtends a smaller angle and it gets less power. So it has to be bigger to collect the same amount of power. When it's further away. Um, so your cell phone has quite a small antenna in it um, and there's a huge amount of work goes into that and you, some of you may remember with one of the iPhones came out and Steve Jobs, Jobs uh, demonstrated it uh, and he put his finger, he used his left hand and he put his hand over the antenna and it, the Wi-Fi didn't work. Um, so attenuation with distance here, we have the same picture, zero dB at one meter, minus six dB at two meters, and minus nine and a half dB at three, me at three meters, and so on. So in terms of spectrum characteristics, we need to calculate if a link was work, will work. And this is done by calculating the dB budget, the decibel budget. We add up the gain of the transmitter and the antenna, and we subtract the loss of the cables, the connectors, and the free space propagation. And we check that the result exceeds the receiver sensitivity by a sufficient margin to have reliable communications. And decibels are a measure of a ratio between values. And I've got some examples in the notes, which if you if you see those, but zero dBm, which is measured relative to, to, to power, um, is one milliwatt, and 20 dBm is 100 milliwatts, and that's what uh, Wi-Fi is allowed to use and minus 20 dBm is 0.01 milliwatt or one hundredth of a milliwatt. So <clears throat> going over spectrum characteristics, spectrum propagation models calculating what geographic area transmit, transmitted signal can be received with a reasonable chance of success. If it wasn't for geographical features like mountains and valleys, this would be a circle or sector on the map, depending on the type of antenna. And typical model, modeling, which assumes exclusive usage of a frequency channel in uh, an area, means that a larger area than the surface, surface area is sterilized or rendered unusable by the same frequency transmitted from another nearby antenna due to co-channel interference. And this is an assumption that older technologies use, which has little selectivity about which signal of a particular frequency is received. That means that only one usage of a particular frequency uh, can be occur in a specific place. Uh, but that's modern technologies like OFDM, um, <coughs> orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, CDMA, co-division multiplex, multiplex access, and MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, which means you've got lots of antenna, make this an incorrect assumption. Indeed, even pretty old technologies like polarizing a signal rendered an oversimplification. And there are about 16 different commercial radio propagation model uh, uh, suites listed at, at, at a, a link that is in the notes. I can 
posted on the, in the in the um, thing as well. And there are also several freeware freeware models, and um, and the service area means the area where the service is intended to be used. So if we look at idealized coverage, an omni antenna would give you a circle in the horizontal plane, um, whereas a sector antenna or a dish will give you a will give you a a, a cone shaped or sector shaped uh, coverage. And here's a real example. This is a radio station um, in Port Elizabeth, and it has the broadcast, the, the transmitter there. The purple area is where the receiver, where you can receive the signal, but this area is where most of the people live. So it wasn't very effective. So some modeling was done oops, to, to um, move the antenna. And if we move the antenna there, then we get much better propagation. And as you can see with the antenna there, now all these populated areas are actually getting the signal. And the mountain where no one lives isn't getting the signal. So essentially, the antenna was on the wrong side of the mountain. And that's the sort of thing you can do with coverage, population modeling. And so you get fancy software from free to very expensive. And are we talking many millions of rands is used to calculate the coverage of a transmitter. And the site I quote there is an example of can allow you to calculate coverage online. Spectrum fees. South Africa, spectrum has traditionally been regarded as a scarce resource, and spectrum within a country is regarded as a national asset. And use of it is usually regulated by regulatory authority, ICASA in our case. And scarcity is due to three factors. First of all, poor technology, which has improved dramatically over the last century, and especially after the, over the last decade or two. And secondly, poor administration, partly due to old models of spectrum assignment. I refer to the sort of manual static spectral assignment that we use today as 1960s spectrum assignment, um, because it is not dynamic. It is not, not, it is not taking into account all the clever stuff we can do today. And then certain, this, most importantly, populuses, popular uses for certain bands due to, uh, due to availability of equipment and or propagation characteristics of that frequency. And that last one is what we call high demand spectrum. And orders show that even in densely populated cities like New York, actual spectrum usage is only about 7 to 11 percent of the theoretical maximum. So spectrum is so scarce, but they're not actually using it. So what are some of the recent advances in radio technology? Wi-Fi, WiMAX, and LTE are some of the newer uses of spectrum. 5G, as, as, as um, Adrian was telling you about, uh, does use LTE um, and uh, a couple other things. And these are based on a number of underlying advances in technology. And the chief of these, the most important, is the move to digital signal processing and the dramatic reduction in the price of DSPs or di di digital signal processors, which are chips, just chips like you have in your phone which allow complex mathematical functions to be carried out on the signal at very high speed. And other advances uh, we've already mentioned are OFDM, MIMO, CDMA, and cognitive radio. Cognitive radio is um, radios with a certain amount of intelligence built into them. I won't go into that in any detail right now, but we can talk about the questions if you like. So in terms of spectrum fees, one way of managing demand for limited resource is to charge fees for its use. And fees reduce the incentive to hold spectrum. A spectrum is not owned by a licensee. He has right of use. And ICASA introduced an administrative incentive pricing or AIP system from uh, April 2012. And no fees are yet charged for broadcast uses. And this system means significant changes for some operators. Some will pay much less, some will pay much more. Most won't be affected much, but everyone needs to know how much they will pay. To give you an idea of what this what this was, is before the introduction of, of AIP, Telcom. was paying 45 million rand a year for their spectrum fees. After the introduction of the AIP, they were received an invoice for 890 million. They said, oops, maybe we can give some of it back to you. But we can't do it quite now. Will you let us off? No. Um, an example is that is that um, in the 16 gigahertz band, um, Vodacom had two uh, 45 megahertz channels just pairs of channels, should I say, and they had about one and a half thousand point to point links using those two pairs of channels. Telcom had, so they used channel A, channel B, channel A, channel B, as they, as they went from one place to the next. So it has a pole and the channel A that way, channel B that way. Um, 
telecom use channel A, channel B, channel C, channel D, channel E, channel F, and they used a, a thousand megahertz to do almost exactly the same number of point to point links. They were just incredibly inefficient because nothing forced them to be efficient. Similarly, um, the 3.5 gigahertz band, which is uh, the subject of the auction and is an important band for, for 5G and for LTE, um, Centec had, uh, had a large slice of it and ICASA asked them to move it from where it was and they said, oh no, that will cost us 75, 70 million rand, will you please pay? And ICASA said no. Um, then when we introduced the AIP in 2012, uh, Centec got a bill for 45 million rand and said, yeah, have it back. We don't need it, actually. We know we're never using it. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, um, we can go on with those sort of things. Um, so annual spectrum fees are calculated using one of two formulae. There's a point to point formula and there's a point to multi point formula. And there's a, a spreadsheet which you can download from the ACASA website that I wrote a million years ago that tells you how to do this. So telecommunication uses, uses for spectrum. Generally, spectrum is used for wireless connection instead of a wired connection. It can be faster and cheaper to set up a wireless connection than trenching for fiber or renting a leased line. And quite often what happens is when one's rolling out a network, you will use a point of wireless connection first whilst you are still building out the rest of your network, particularly if you're building out a fiber network or something like that. Uh, communications are usually two-way. And they're limited in distance, depending on line of sight, the frequency used, the antenna height, the type of towers, the transmitter power, and all kinds of things. And line of sight mean, refers to being able to see with the naked eye or a telescope from one antenna to the other. It's a, not, it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition for most wireless communications. Uh, Fresnel zone and multipath path we can talk about another time. And there's some complicated stuff that I'm not going to talk about here, but contrast this with fiber connections. Um, where the maximum speed is essentially limited by how much money you want to spend on the equipment on each end. Fiber itself has no intrinsic limit on the capacity of the fiber. Um, the radio use is limited to the maximum speed, and annual fees are charged for the use of spectrum unless it's an exempted use, like, for example, Wi Fi, and a, uh, an electronic communications network service license is required unless you're exempted. So let's talk about duplex com com communications. Duplex is where one, half duplex is when one party talks at a time, and full duplex is when both parties talk at the same time. And there are two ways of doing full, full duplex. Um, and that's, by the way, when people say over when they finish talking on a military aircraft or ship radio, because it's a half duplex thing. Over means I have finished talking, you can start. There are two different ways of doing bi bidirectional communication. There's uh, uh, multiplex, we need you, we can use time division duplexing called TDD, and that means that the two parties take turns to talk. They both use the same channel but at different times and in different directions of transmission. And frequency division duplexing or FTD means the two parties each transmit on different frequency. Frequency they can therefore do this simultaneously. These frequencies are usually assigned in pairs. Uh, party A transmits on frequency A and listens on frequency B, and party B transmits on frequency B and listens on frequency A. Other schemes exist, mostly CDMA, um, a code division multi use, which is used in CDMA and OFDM, where a coded value distinguishes between signal sources, and OFDM, where you have uh, 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 anything up to several thousand uh, very small channels, and you spread the signal over all these channels. And if you lose one or two, then you, you, it doesn't matter, you still are able to recover the signal. So in LTE, um, we've got FTE on, FDD on the left, we've got frequency division downlink, uh, uh, duplexing on the left with the downlink at the higher frequency. We've got frequency on the y-axis and uh, uplink on the lower frequency in blue with time on the on the x-axis. And using TDD uh, with LTE or other things, we have uplink, downlink, uplink, downlink, um, uh, 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 alternating in time. The big benefit of TDE for um, for 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 broadband is that you can adjust the period that you that you are used for uplink or downlink depending on how much data you have to travel in each direction the disadvantage of it is is as you can see there is a small gap in between um, when nothing happens but in fact uh, LTE uh, uh, is so well timed that that gap is is is, is pretty well negligible the ITU recommendation recommends these uh, these 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 um, 
uh, uh, options for for the uh, 2.5, 2.6 band, and we've chosen option one in South Africa. Uh, point to point links are used to communicate typically between two fixed points. So if you've got a Wi-Fi, uh, a wireless uh, service provider um, providing you with a connection, you have a point to point link with him. He may or may not be have a, a point to multi point link on the other end. Um, each end has an antenna connected to a transceiver by a cable, and the antenna may be mounted on a tower or other high point to improve propagation. Um, remember, the Earth is curved, and if you're going anything over about 10 k's, you uh, can't actually see over the, the horizon uh, at, at eye height. Important parameters are the frequency, assuming the Earth was perfectly flat and there was nothing in the way, obviously. Important parameters are the frequency bandwidth and the link length, and several frequency bands are available where the number of possible links is almost unlimited. So a point to point looks like this, where you've got, you may have a, a, a main office and a building with a connection to the telephone, and they're using uh, ISM bands or Wi-Fi bands, 2.4 or 5 gigahertz, and they and they have a branch office and they have an outdoor bridge between them with a cable, uh, I mean a wireless link linking the two. And that can be anything up to 40 kilometers. In fact, the record in South Africa for a point-to-point -point Wi-Fi link is 108 kilometers. It was across two from two mountain top to mountain top. So that does that that allows you to link without having to pay. Tocom or anybody else for a leased line. Um, you can have multiple point-to-point -point links. It's not obvious how it's possible, but many point-to-point -point links can operate simultaneously in the same area at the same frequency at the same time. And this is a function of the use of directional antennae. A high gain antenna, like a dish, can focus the radiation to quite a narrow, relatively high power beam. And this beam is aimed at the other end of the link, which also has a similar dish. And these dish antennae have a good rejection of received energy that comes from a wider angle to its center line. And interference is thus minimized. And so here we have an example where the red antenna <coughs> beams, uh, points its beam at the green antenna, and the green antenna points its beam back. And the high gain means a better reception at a distance without higher transmitted power and good rejection of incidence signals, signals from uh, uh, in the same frequency from other directions. And in fact, you can have many point-to-point -point links like this. These links don't interfere with each other. None of these links interfere with each other. They can be exactly the same frequency. It's not a problem. They cross through each other. They don't make any problems, so long as they have an oblique angle. However, if you have a frequency, two channels like this on the same frequency, you will have a problem there because those, there won't be sufficient rejection of the signals from the, two, the other, the, from this one versus this one. So we have to remove that one in order to avoid, avoid um, Interference, and this is what one does with the with the uh, propagation modeling uh, software. And this process is called coordination. It's computationally intensive and takes some time to complete. Uh, with today, today's equipment, you can expect to coordinate perhaps 200 uses in 24 hours of server time. Although that is improving all the time. This was written a little while ago, uh, so that's probably probably an order of magnitude more than that. Okay, so point to multi point links of PTMP are used to communicate typically being at one fixed point and any number of mobile or fixed points within a fixed coverage area. And each end has an antenna connected to a transceiver bar cable. The central antenna may be mounted on a tire or other high point to improve propagation. The other points may be held hand held with very small antennae or fixed antennae mounted on walls or roofs, which give a better signal. Sorry. The important parameters are the frequency, the bandwidth, and the area sterilized. And he has a picture of, uh, of that. You've got a root bridge on the one building, and it's got an omnidirectional antenna, and the uh, client bridges and laptops and so on um, uh, in, uh, in this coverage area. And this is typical for Wi-Fi uh, on a, in a campus environment. If we talk about cells in a point to point, multi-point scenario, the reason it's called cellular radio is because it looks like this. It looks like the cells in a honeycomb. And you can see there the, how the, the, the orange area, uh, sorry, the pink area, is one mapping of the frequencies. And you can see that there's so there are frequency, 12 frequencies used in this model. Uh, um, and I've highlighted frequency number one. So when, when a, 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 an operator is given a five megahertz slice, of, of spectrum in whichever band it might be, he will subdivide it into these smaller smaller bands, which he then uses in his various cells. And then frequency one will be repeated again there. 
and there, and there, and there, and there. So if you look carefully, you'll see that the same pattern is being repeated throughout there, although I've only highlighted one, one um, instance of it. And that is how we get free, efficient frequency reuse. Now notice that the distance between this usage of cell one and uh, frequency one and this frequency use of frequency one has to be far enough to avoid co-channel interference. But the, the little hexagon there, that is the coverage area or the service area of that particular cell, cell station, which does increase and decrease slightly. Sorry, William. The pen called breathing. I can give you on... maybe one or two minutes to finish because we are supposed to officially finish at half past five minutes. Okay, Ducky. I will speed it up. Okay, so let's just briefly talk about high demand spectrum. And that's the spectrum that allows a provision of wireless broadband services. And that's the list of them. And these are the ones that are currently available in South Africa. That's the total spectrum on the left middle column and how much of it's in the right hand, it's still unused in the right hand column. This is who has how much spectrum already assigned. Where it says Neotel there, they've changed the name to Rain. Um, this is the fees for those different bands and uh, the coverage area uh, of each. And these are the assignments. You will notice that Telcom has seven assignments which is more than everyone else except for uh, uh, double every almost double everyone else except for mtn and has well over double the amount of spectrum as every, everyone else um <clears throat> so the telcom have still have uh, uh, a disproportionate amount of spectrum they are the one of the people though who took um uh, this is the spectrum already assigned, and there's the license fees. Oh, I seem to have duplicated them. My apologies. So the high demand spectrum auction, ICASA has issued uh, uh, an inv in invitation to apply. The process started in October. It was supposed to be finished now, and uh, they were taken to court by, sorry, not MTN and Telcom, uh, Vodacom, Telcom and uh, 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 MTN. Um, and the minister of the telecom was complaining that they didn't get enough spectrum, and MTM was complaining that why can't they, why, why should any new entrants be allowed in, and why can't they have all the spectrum? Um, and the minister said today that it's most likely to be settled out of court. Um, and this is a snapshot of the allocated target spectrum, 5G spectrum around the world, which Adrian talked about, so I'm not going to bother about that, but speak very much about that. And in conclusion, um, the 5G frequency range one uses the same frequency that we're using now for terrestrial television, analog and digital, Wi-Fi, GSM, and LTE. The frequency range two uses much higher frequencies. These allow very high speeds, but it has very limited range, typically within a single room. And South, South Africa has failed to make high demand spectrum available since before 2009. And one operator, RAIN, is currently running a 5G network in South Africa and maybe others. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, William, for an excellent summary of the critical basics of telecom and uh, the accelerated overview of the current uh, situation with spectrum. Um, so I would like to remind uh, that uh, uh, people are welcome to join uh, SAIE telecom section. And um, the link is in the box. Uh, in the uh, chat and uh, now i think let's start with <coughs> the questions and discussions and uh, the panel discussion now will also be joined by mr julian uh, stafford uh, from european utilities uh, technologies council um, well as a summary a very brief summary of what was said so low frequencies good propagation longer distances better coverage uh, probably most interesting to utilities High frequencies, uh, very wide bandwidth, more users, more speeds, but less distance, less coverage, so um, different applications. The cost of utility devices is low. Uptake uh, is uh, uh, going to be dependent on the technologies. Uh, GPRS is still uh, highly used. Well, <laughs> One of the questions we got is uh, with the advent of software defined radio and dynamic spectrum allocation, what spectrum pricing models are or should be considered? Who wants to take the question? I, I don't I, I don't mind taking that if you if you like, that's okay. 
Um, good afternoon or evening, everyone, and thanks to William and Adrian for the presentation. So I think that's a really good question, the whole area around the pricing models for Spectrum, because historically, the last 20 to 25 years over the de development of public mobile networks, Spectrum has been viewed by regulators as a source of revenue for the Treasury. Um, I think now as we tend to move into the 21st century in the era of 5G and eventually 6G, actually the, the socioeconomic benefits of Spectrum to society for the use by education, by automotive, by medicine, by transport and so on, exceeds what the, the value of the Spectrum may be in terms of a few, a few million rand or euros or, or, or dollars to the regulator. And we're actually seeing some very interesting uh, models evolving now in Japan and in Finland and so on, where people are actually being asked, what are you going to use this spectrum for and what benefits does this bring to the economy as a whole, rather than just a one-off payment for a block of spectrum. So I don't know, Adrian, do you have anything to add to that? It's a topic we've, we've discussed previously. Yeah, I think it's, it's quite important, obviously, you know, the social benefit of, of spectrum particularly that's one angle we have from utilities bringing electricity to people bringing clean water sewage is is more important perhaps than just having um, a higher um, bandwidth communications i think there was also an element there in the first question about software defined radios which if i've picked up um software defined radios are good in theory but we find the front end of them are very open to um, interference or being blocked by high power systems nearby so they're not as good as uh, they're not the solution that solves all our problems so i think those are my comments yeah i think adrian that's that's a really good point about the sdrs and actually william i think it sort of reflects on what you were talking about about the technical technological advances in the past 50 60 70 years but especially the last 10 15 years to improve the efficient use of spectrum and if you buy relatively cheap software defined radios with poor receiver performance at the front end then you're actually throwing away some of the spectrum efficiency that you could that you could gain so. the other issue yeah. about about the spectrum so, um, auctions is that the multiplier effect of the putting that spectrum spectrum into use um, has is about eight times um, the value of the auction in terms of the uh, contribution to GDP. So if you sell the spectrum for 1 billion, you can expect your GDP to increase by 8 billion. Wow, impressive. Mm. Uh, and that assumes that uh, um, whoever buys the spectrum would be able to utilize it for something useful and that's why it's possible to raise eight times more in gdp compared to the price for which the spectrum was sold yes well albert that's why that's why regulators charge fees annual fees for spectrum um to ensure that you don't just buy it unless you've got very deep pockets you don't just buy it to prevent someone else from using it uh, or because you might want to use it one day um, the fees are pitched um, such that if you are using it for commercial purposes, um, then the, it's a relatively small part of your cost. Um, but if you're not using it for commercial purposes, um, then it's a significant cost. Where this falls apart um, is, is, for example, people, the amateur radio um, usage um, where there, and, and emergency usage where there's no there's no commercial benefit from it, and that's an issue that regulators have to deal with, and and uh, hopefully provide ex exemptions for that. I think we've um, dealt with the social economic benefit of of utility radio as well. That actually, from work in the states, we've discovered that the utility radio may have 150 times the actual financial cost of that spectrum, because although from a utility point of view you can operate more efficiently. The electricity is needed for obviously for telecoms but also for um for lighting for the banking system for delivery of fuel and all those other aspects so electricity we see particularly as, as being important to have a very efficient um control system and that control system increasingly depends on radio so thank you thank you um 
uh, thought uh, maybe it's important to ask this one. Uh, so uh, somebody, uh, some of you might want to comment. What is sunset for cellular bands? And what can you say about sunset in South Africa? Um, how we would affect utilities and other industries relying on older technologies such as GSM or GPRS or 3D? Uh, I know that there are uh, some bands uh, which are sunset uh, in uh, Switzerland, in Australia. So, anyone to comment? I didn't. I didn't hear the first part of your of your state your question, um, Albert. Okay. Um, so there is a phenomenon uh, often called sunset, sunset for frequency bands located to all the technologies when they're basically being switched off. Uh, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think GSM, uh, so GPRS was switched off, I think in Switzerland, in Australia, something like that. And there, uh, well, a number of countries are planning to switch off uh, all the technologies because they're less efficient and generate less money for them. So um, uh, I thought if anybody could comment on what uh, you know about sunset for any bonds in South Africa and uh, how do you think it will affect utilities and other industries relying on all the technologies such as GSM or GPRS or CD? I can answer so, that. Yeah, fire away, Willie. Thank you. Okay, two things. One, one is that GPRS is a technology rather than a frequency. Um, uh, GPRS is not switched off in this country and won't be switched off for quite a while. And the reason is that the bank's um, point of sale devices, the card readers, use GPRS. Um, so until they move to another technology, the mobile operators are obliged to keep GPRS um, running although it's very inefficient in today's world. Um, and there's, of course, no incentive for the banks to change until and, and, and unless the mobile operators um, say, OK, we're switching it off at such and such a date. And that, in fact, happened in, with, 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 um, with uh, uh, um, good grief, what's it called? Um, <laughs> it, the words escape my head. Um, the telecom, telecoms, uh, 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 data carry service over 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 um, telephone lines called DSL. Um, telecom insisted on 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 using um, ATM uh, enabled DSLAMs for the for the DSL, and they carried on doing so uh, instead of using the far more efficient and far more cheaper uh, uh, ethernet enabled these lamps um, until the manufacturer said we're not making ATM anymore <laughs> and similar with their lease lines um, if you bought if you bought a sub two megahertz or two megahertz or, or less uh, lease line from telecom it was using ATM technology um, so so you need you need to force people sometimes to stop using a particular technology but in terms of spectrum uh, ICASA does have a frequency migration plan um, and it's a multi-volume uh, uh, well, a large set of documents and it st st sets out in that when certain users have to migrate out of certain certain bands but I think in, in Europe 3G is likely to be discontinued first but Julian you did some work on GSM and uh, the, the problems in Europe that would be uh, occur if we switched off GSM. Do you want to say anything? We, we did. So this was actually a, a study commenced by the European Commission last year about the impending impacts of 2G and 3G switch off. Uh, Singapore, I think, is another place that shut down those systems already. And of course, these devices and technologies are embedded within utility infrastructure, whether that's in remote telemetry units, ringing back SCADA data, or whether it's in smart meters. And of course, these tend to be devices which are not normally uh, monitored by, by humans. You know, these are remotely located devices and the cost of replacing these with a, a 4G or 5G modem, it's not the cost of the modem, it's the cost of the access to the location, which could run into hundreds or, or in many cases thousands of dollars or euros for each replacement because of the complex places to, to access. And in fact, this is one of the reasons that utilities focus now a lot uh, potentially on, on private networks 
because the rate of change in the public network space is completely out of sync with the investment cycles of utilities. So a, a utility invests in a transformer, for instance, and expects it to last for 50 years. I'm not saying we expect a telecom solution to last for 50 years, but a technology refresh cycle of five or six or seven years just doesn't it just doesn't work for, for utilities. So they need more control over their own their own assets. Yeah, an issue we have on that in, sorry, Albert, it, we have on the subject in Africa is is that many people have still have old phones, you know, the the hundred rand phone um, that only manages to do GSM and nothing and, and SMS and nothing else, you know, not lower than a feature phone and certainly not a smartphone. So and that's a substantial portion of the market in terms of numbers. Not a big part in terms of, of, of revenue for the operators, but it is nevertheless a, a problem for them to switch off that technology. Another problem. Yeah, uh, so, so I guess it's uh, quite so valid comment, especially for Africa, where uh, well, some money would need to be found to replace the technologies, and uh, lots of people are not going to be able to convert to new technologies uh, very fast. So it is going to be a social problem in addition to, uh, addition to economical. And as a port, uh, the comment about uh, the value um, as uh, the reason why house, houses, uh, uh, I think, uh, are so popular as a good investment is because uh, they stay there for 100 years with minimal maintenance. And uh, <laughs> if you want to change your plugs, electrical circuits in the house every five or 10 years, it's going <laughs> to change that number drastically. Yes, that's um, a, good, uh, a good parallel, yeah. Um, I think we are quite far beyond uh, the allocated time limit. Um, there are a few questions which uh, um, might be interested uh, in to ask, but uh, I think uh, Minx mentioned it's possible. Uh, it will be possible to post those questions to you and uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be answered offline. So um, uh, with this, I would like to thank. Uh, uh, the, our distinguished speakers and uh, uh, the uh, event participants, most of whom are still with us, uh, and of course the supporters of this uh, series of events for making this and other events uh, possible and so great. Thank you very much. Um, and I hope that uh, uh, most of you will be able to join us for more of this 5G series of events. Uh, we plan events uh, around uh, health and safety, uh, opportunities for SMEs and entrepreneurship, uh, 5G applications, equipment ecosystems in 5G, and uh, uh, concluding eventually with research towards 6G. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, have a very good evening and keep safe. Thank you very much. Very Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.